Cursed by the old gods in Bethany, we are five immortals doomed to roam the galaxy until we complete our thousand and one tasks. After centuries of having our memories dicked around, we are complete our destiny and die. We are, for now, the immortals. This is episode 98. Woo! Mm. Woohoo! 98 is two away from 100, which is pretty cool, because 100 is a big number. That's, that's one of the lamer math facts. I mean, I'm, I'm not really trying. Me neither. There's nothing I can think of. For the audience has noticed. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Sometimes this happens, guys. It's you know. okay. We have a slow episode. We're going to have a catch of like 80 hinge facts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to do a whole hinge fact episode. That's definitely going to happen and is in no way an exaggeration. Is 98 the number in French that has the most letters before 100? Because of the 420... 88. No, it would be... H-U-I-T, S-E-P-T, N-E-U-F. Oh, they all have the same number. Yeah. 17, it, 18, it, French 19. does this stupid thing where 80 is 420, which is 420s. Yep. And then 90. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and then both the 70s and the 90s, you actually don't count as like their own thing. Yep. You say like 6013 for 73, and you say like 8018 for 98. No, you say 42018. Oh yeah, that's actually true. No, you're right. You say 42018, four which is ridiculous. This explains a lot more about Pedro now. It's really dumb. Is this just how you casually say it's, numbers? It's not I find it deeply irritating. It's an entire language of that you speak. A really old, yeah, so. I don't think in terms I've of I've always wondered how that like subtly changes their <laughs> ideas about numbers. Like, I don't know, it just seems like well, it's such we, a, we used to such do a different that, way to count. I don't know. Just like four and twenty blackbirds, that sort of thing. Like, well, yeah, but that's like, but I mean, the, the, it's the eighty eighteen that I find very strange. <laughs> like that ninety isn't like its own set of numbers, and neither is seventy. Mm-hmm. It's weird. I'm Austin. I'm Adam. I'm Sarah. I'm Lee. And I'm Pedro. And this is a review show, as you <laughs> can tell. Sometimes we talk about numbers for some reason. I mean, we have numbers a are segment. numbers we... are kind of key to the whole the whole so, thing. You want to talk about how many uh, things we're trying to review here without using numbers? Or which no, episode not, it is. I'm not saying or... ban numbers. Okay. We're just not supposed to talk about the very basic it's, thing. You know, yeah, part yeah. Of not have a 20 minute long discussion about them. Yeah, you hook the audience. Get them at the beginning. Yeah, with, I, with numbers. We have yeah. not done that in 98 episodes. We I have very we low have. reach I amongst feel, mathematicians. I feel that people them. like our number facts, and if anyone disagrees, they should tell us. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that everybody likes them. I disagree. Well, that's great. <laughs> for you. I disagree. You guys Too don't bad. count. You're not listening. They kind of count more. Than Adam, you. when have you listened to this podcast? Weekly. Often. I Pretty don't often. believe you. You know, when I'm editing it sometimes. Yeah. Yep, that's, that's about it. Good. Yep. <laughs> but here's, here's a great question. For the episodes that any of you guys have missed, have you listened to that episode? I have. I haven't, I haven't yes. because one of them I did, but one of them I, a lot of times it's like I, I'm reviewing the thing, so I don't want to listen to it before and then I forget. I never missed an episode. Oh. Bam. <laughs> 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 Bam. Bam. So great. But I can't do it. We just don't record that week. Indeed. <laughs> Anyhow, but what do we record? Uh, some reviews and stuff. Yes, things. exactly. Stuff and In things. fact, we reviewed the thousand and one movies, albums, food, songs, children's books, and TV shows that you must consume before you die. Still don't like that word consume. I know this is a deep cut, but oh, it God, bugs no. me. It, it's, it's the best word for all six uh, categories. I don't know about that, I but agree. whatever. Consume is the best. I like consume. Oh, you guys are the worst. Anywho, here we are traveling on a spaceship, flying through the stars, looking for some old gods to help them out. Spaceship's the small, small spaceship. It is, it's... It is getting small. We, we praised how big it was earlier. It's growing on me and that it's growing smaller, I feel. Pedro, is that, is that, is that, is it supposed to feel this way? Is it supposed to feel like it's always getting smaller? Always, it, always, always smaller? I mean, I can turn off that. Uh, can you? <laughs> yeah, please. I've been slowly shrinking it. Why? I feel like we have, uh... We don't we don't talk to each other enough. No, we, we talk to each other do... all the time. We oh only my talk god! To each other. I feel like we need to be more intimate. Well, I mean, like, no, I, don't, I don't feel I, that way. Why do you think I'm all in here by myself? That's, That's true. true. Yeah. But he's all alone. Yeah, Lee, why are you why are you bothered about how small the ship is? You're in the exact same place. There's no people around. No, my room is getting smaller too. Ooh, fair. Like I will say, you guys are giddy on my nerves or thing. But like the other day, I was going to go to the shower, and then I opened the curtain, and there was Pedro, apparently, watering, like, 14 Chia Pets. Well, yeah. Ch-ch-ch-chia! And then I go to the other shower, and there are more Chia Pets there. It's just, it, you're, it feels like you're always around, you're always watering Chia Pets. I, mean, chia pets I have great. to make oxygen choices. 
And oh, chia pets were your go-to. Wait, that's our that's our main option. That's our oxygen, oxygen source. Chia pets, yeah. It's just water and a clay thingy. I think the fact oh, that we're a boy have not noticed how little oxygen is on this ship. It's really not true. into the chia pet room. That might be contributing to some things. All right, whatever. It's a problem. It's just enough we're... to support the pets. <laughs> <laughs> They're the only ones actually breathing. I mean, we're immortal, so. Yeah. yeah. So why are you oh, doing this? Boy. Well, because it can still feel like we're suffocating. We are not free of ailment. That's true. definitely true. It doesn't kill us. Add out the torture log of the show. Yeah. It's a dense show, guys. I've had the robotic plague for like... Dense... 600 years. ...show. Anyhow, this week, we're reviewing the 757th entries of all that stuff that was assigned to us by the AI on the ship, Marion. Marion, how you doing today? Fuck you, Austin. She's doing great. And it's, it's just a nice uh, set we got here. The movie is Wings of Desire. The album is Teenager of the Year by Frank Black. Food is Casa Reap. The song is Enter Sandman by Metallica. The children's book is Eclipse of the Crescent Moon by Giza Gardonier. And the TV show is For Brundelson, which is also known as The Killing. But first, Wings of Desire. Wings of Desire is the acclaimed 1987 film written and directed by Vim Vendors. We previously covered him, I think, way back on episode three with mm-hmm. the great film Paris, Texas. This is a different type of film, but I feel you can tell it's the same director. Oh, for sure. It is a fantasy film about the, there are angels who walk among us, particularly we look at Berlin. We just see these two angels who observe humanity, hear their thoughts, Prep put a hand on their shoulder as just a moment of kindness. And really, mostly all they do is observe. They don't tend to interfere that much. And we watch as one angel, who seems to have been around for a very long time, start to dream of something to feel the joy and pains that a human does. It is shot in gorgeous black and white until you get moments of passion where you see the color of the world. And I love this film so much. So good. It's beautiful. Can't tell from your faces right now if you guys agree with me. But the audio podcast, we're all in the same realm right now. But the one who avoided the eye contact the most is Pedro. So, Pedro, what did you think of this one? I wanted to like it more than I did. You still can. <laughs> I, yeah, I, mean, I probably can. This, this probably deserves another more pensive watch, I guess. The movie is actually really well done. It's beautifully shot. Everyone's great in it. Most of it's not even dialogue. Um, no, it's many monologues. It's mostly just monologues. Of spare thoughts that you hear. The writing is always beautiful and well done, but it wasn't exciting. No. At all. No. And not that it needs to be. I just wasn't in the mood to watch a bunch of people talk in their heads about things. Like, that could have been shrunk by most of it. It was like, movies two hours and ten minutes. I'd say a good hour and a half is just walking around and listening to what people are thinking. You don't need every single one of those cuts. If this was like a half hour long short, I would love it. If it was like a two hour and ten minute movie, I would love it. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm all for people walking around and talking. This is people sitting and talking as well. It's great. Sitting and talk? Now, on a scale of the Austin favorite movies, is sitting and talking better than walking and talking? Equal to walking and talking? Or worse than walking and talking? I mean... It could be equal if done well, right. It's actually not because there's no talking, and the main it's character is don't, actually people walking. People don't converse. Everywhere. Sure, people are sitting there. You hear their thoughts, but it's constantly moving because the angel is. But it, it's walking so around. it's so beautifully done because when you drop in on someone for even just one line or ten of their monologue, you get them. It all sounds like it's part of this world, which does have a certain voice to it. Mm. But it is like you start to know who they are. But like, okay, so one thing, uh, this actually got me thinking, do we all think in such poetic ways I was just in a... our head? Because I don't know if that's how everyone thinks. I'm like, does everyone really think this way? And I'm thinking, like, I think they imply maybe the I movie do, maybe I don't, I don't know. That the angels kind of hear the soul, not exactly the mind. I think it was in the middle of the film. Well, that... they hear only what is spiritual. It's one of the things that they mention at one point. So they only hear 
the thoughts that are about the metaphysical and the spiritual. It's not like I have to go to the grocery store. No one says that. I don't know whether everybody thinks like that, but Vim v Vendors thinks the way I think. Not to say that my thoughts are like super eloquent, but like a lot of the themes that he's dealing with in these sort of thought monologues, it just really resonates with me. I spend a kind of immense amount of time thinking about the metaphysical. And it's rare that you see a movie that talks about that directly, that says, yes, human beings walking around Berlin doing their grocery shopping and little kids playing with dolls are thinking about the nature of the universe and the soul. I don't know, I can't think of a lot of other movies that really delve into that part of human experience. It, to me, the, one of the most approachable ways, because yeah, I mean, yeah. Ingmar Bergman films do that too. I was going to say, Ingmar Bergman would be the other, but it's in this very abstracted way that is super not accessible. And this thing I could just watch every day, because it has a beauty and comfort to it. I mean, I love the idea that in the world, perhaps the one who understands the most about life and love is Peter Falk. <laughs> as, as Peter Falk. Actually Peter Falk. Just Peter just Falk himself dude. is the guy who knows it all. Much like when the creator of The Good Place said when he was thinking about making you know, the, the heaven that is in that NBC sitcom, he said, it would be really comforting the first thing you see when you go to the afterlife is Ted Danson welcoming you. It's true. I know I'm in a good place. <laughs> it's true. It's Ted Danson. But who is he? Peter Falk? Yeah. Columbo. Columbo. He's Columbo. But also I love him in Murder by Death. and um... He's the grandpa at the beginning of Princess Bride. Oh, okay, yeah. I know who you're talking about. So he was the director. Yeah. No. Yes. No, in the film, he was Fox, the actor. The actor. Fox the actor. Was he a director. He was. Oh. He was himself. He was Peter, Peter Falk. Falk. He did, wasn't playing a character. Oh shit! Okay. Yeah, like he, that he drew the a, drew the old yeah. lady. Okay, because he's an actor who is like the name star is going to be in this German film that's being made, and even when the main female sees him at that food court, oh, that she sees him, visits him, and then calls him lieutenant because it's Lieutenant Columbo, and he smirks, and then they talk about a missing person case because he's Columbo. Cool. You don't know who Columbo is? Nope. Okay. Oh, then, yeah, it's funny. I think I've maybe seen one episode of Columbo in my entire life, but I know who Columbo is. Like, for me, he's a very iconic figure. I think the, yeah. uh, I, th I feel like the modern equivalent would be, like, if this movie was made today, you could have Sam Waterston do this. Like, yeah. the Law, yeah. Law and Order Sam Waterston could do this. Wait, in Wings of Desire? Yes, I think you could say, you could replace Columbo, because this was made in the 80s, with Sam Waterston as himself. You just no, have, I did, you no, haven't was, seen enough Law and Order. Think, no, no, but, like, but, but Peter Falk just has like this, all ages love him. And he's just this kind of this true. figure this of true. like this huggable guy. To and, Sarah's like, point though, when I watched this, I was at one point like, is that Sam Watterson? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Like it, it'd be Tom Hanks now. No. No. It would be Patrick Stewart. Oh, Patrick Stewart. Yeah. I would do that. That would, that makes sense to me. As himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did he make this before Paris, Texas? After. After? Huh. Wow. Really? Uh, isn't Paris, Texas 84 and 37? I mean, he's been making films for a while now. It just seems really film school-y. Yeah, it came, Paris, Texas came out in 1984. And this is later. Yeah. This is 87. It doesn't feel like that late in the 80s. It feels I really know. early. Weirdly, I had the same feeling of like eighty-seven. That still seems. I really thought it was late seventies. Yeah, like yeah, then again, I also yeah. <laughs> would probably say that about Paris, Texas. So maybe that's just. Well, he, and he made a lot of, just like of 70s. seventy films and really had a good sense of like seventy filmmaking. But I believe. Right, right, right. I mean, Vin Vitter's still alive, right? I mean, I he, think so. He had a film a handful of years ago that was a three D ballet film. Huh. So, so it looks like you weren't uh, enchanted by the angels walking among us. No, not at all. Um, Pedro said that it was not entertaining and I agree with that or exciting but it's also it wasn't even engaging for me because like the characters that we're supposed to latch on to are just listening to other people and they're not actually doing anything or trying for anything I know the one guy is like thinking about being a human but he doesn't until like two thirds of the way through and then it's just him like exploring what it's like to be a human rather than just a spectator and that's it's just not interesting to me it's it's just really boring from start to finish i hated it
Wow. Well, like when he becomes a human, like he doesn't have the adventure that you expect, which I think is kind of jarring. Like he goes and he gets money and he buys clothes, but we don't see him buying clothes. We don't see him trying to figure out or trying to deal with money for the first time ever. So like, I feel like that, that would have been, that would have given us something else to like, that's like relate the, to his character. That's like the opposite of what I wanted, just because that's such like a... I feel like I've, I've seen that movie before. The only thing that bummed me out about the transformation of him becoming a human was I was bummed that it involved a woman, like the, the circus performer. Like, I think that with all the metaphysical stuff going on, like, I didn't, I didn't need that. I don't I know. I think connection to another person Yeah, but like, is, I guess I, is I, part I, of his, his yearning. I guess, like, I... I don't know. I think it would have been even more interesting to explore that without it being a scantily clad circus performer. Not that I think it was exploitative. It just like seemed a little predictable. See, um, I, I never thought of her as, as scantily clad because to have a, a main character the way he is, where he actually does not talk that much because essentially mm-hmm. all he does is talk to his fellow angel. The camera is very, very important in this because the camera not only acts as an observer of the director's eye but actually how the angel is seeing things and for her and her attire um her outfits it has wings at the beginning and she keeps referring to them as like the chicken wings and whatnot but then when she's not wearing the wings the film keeps wanting to focus on her back basically to say these are her wingless backs these are her she is not an angel it's the it's the biggest like difference physically between the two of them so i always like the the staring at the bare back i thought was not just a a a lustful eye of the camera i'm just saying like it felt a little predictable to me but yeah no i agree other than that like like i was glad that they didn't do a like a fish out of water story with him that that wasn't that wasn't sort of a big part of what they were doing it was more of that metaphysical sort of experience of being human. I Good Omens came to mind when I was mm-hmm. the book, which is the Neil Gaiman Terry Pratchett a collaboration. It's funny because like the movie right now I'm thinking of that essentially you guys keep describing is Splash. <laughs> so true. And I think That's very true. That is <laughs> I think Wings of Desire is better than Splash. I agree. I just felt like that this was a watered down Terry Gilliam movie. But that sounds great to me. Because Terry Gilliam's exhausting. <laughs> He is, but I like, I appreciate it more because it steps outside the box just a little bit more. And this movie needed to make up its mind. It's like right on the edge of the box and it needs to make up its mind whether it's going to be a very traditional movie or a very outlandish movie. And it can't do this middle of the road, wishy-washy, boring nonsense. I totally disagree. I think this movie is, like, look, there, I have negative things to say about the movie too, but I think that it... It may be slow, and it may not engage everyone, but I certainly don't think it's boring. I mean, just the way that it's shot, the the way that it plays with the black and white and color, the way that it examines different parts of humanity. I mean, I will admit, if Austin's favorite genre is people talking to each other and nothing happening, I like getting inside people's heads. I think that's cool. And this movie, I think this movie knows exactly what it is. And I, I appreciate that about it. Uh, it's... It is no Paris, Texas. Paris, Texas hits for me a, a combination of knowing exactly what it is and also and that and this sort of hauntingly beautiful thing that Vim Benders is able to do just with the way that he does shots and lots of things. Paris, Texas is enigmatic and complex in a way that Wings of Desire is kind of a fairy tale. Like it's a very different kind of movie. So it's not the best thing that Vim Benders has done. I think I've seen two Vim Benders movies and. Paris, Texas is fucking amazing, and this is very, very good, but... Well, it just, it didn't feel like anything was ever at stake, and there's something like really, really big at stake here. He's a man who has fallen in love, but to go after the one he loves, he has to give up his immortality. That's something kind of big, and it's like, yeah, you know what? I think I'm gonna do it. I think I'm gonna go give up my immortality. That decision was so blasé, it was like, you know what? I am going to go get McDonald's today after work. I like it, though, because I feel like the reasons that he's doing it are... Also horrid. Well, no, they're not... As much as I think it's a little predictable that it's a beautiful woman, I mean, like, they're not... But it's like, not just deep her. love. Like, they're about experience and a sort of feeling of, like, mm-hmm. I have done this and this is my next great adventure. I didn't... 
I didn't see it as blasé as much as I saw it as a character who's been around too long to have strong emotions, I guess. No, I mean, th- this character is someone who feels his existence as an angel is, at this point, his curiosity is making his life like a hell. He can't have any effect on anything. And all he does is observe and watch people who get to experience the most mundane things that he wishes he could do. So we miss some of the farcical things of him adapting to the world, but we see things like he cuts his hand and he just kind of can't stop looking at it. He's watching a film set where they are also trying to kind of understand the emotions of people of the past as they are recreating like a war film of German history. These quiet things, because even like he just, every time he looks and hears, his decision is becoming clearer in his mind. So I think this is the end of perhaps a centuries-long decision. I don't know, there's something beautiful about a quiet observation leading towards the most important moment, and they're not people who can communicate, so there is no scene of deciding. What if they could communicate? Are you trying to set up a discussion of the remake? <laughs> I love the remake. I've never seen the I love remake. Is a I didn't know there was word, a remake. But... Tell me more. It's, no, I, I've never it's seen Nick it. Nick Cage I... being Nick Cage. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of Hitler, it's Nick Cage. But, oh, it's fun. He actually can, they can appear to people if they so choose. They can't really do anything. But they Is can. it called Wings of Desire? No, City of Angels. City of Angels. Oh, I did not realize that was a remake of this i haven't seen it but i've heard of it it's not as good of a film it's I can a recognize loosely that. based remake right the ending is very different the ending is, actually i thought the ending was real interesting in the city of angels tell me off mic what it is okay because i like i love film too much so i don't want to see a remake of it mm-hmm. no that's fair it's not as good of a film probably won't even like it does it have obstacles in the story Who needs i think it? so oh, why do we no, need more really. obstacles because that's what a screen. story is. <laughs> well, why does every film have to be a story? That's kind of what the definition of a film is. I, well. All right, to be, to be <laughs> fair, the entire, like, him being an angel part of the film was the obstacle to him experiencing that thing that he's missing. But having the entire first 90 minutes be that. Oh, I would watch the first 90 minutes forever. I love it. I think that just ends up being a difference of opinion. Like, I know, oh, I yeah. completely agree. No, that's that's sort of what I'm saying. Like, I totally get why people are not into it. It is for me, because I always want to be inside people's heads. I'm there for that. I just think that, it's, like, this movie's not for everybody. If you if you want to listen to what's inside people's heads for a while, and then quiet, maybe, story about musings on that thing, you're going to be into this. If that sounds like hell, <laughs> it will be. At least when the greatest films were made. I'm a fan. Oh. Pitt referred to the main guy as Hitler. That wasn't a commentary on his character. The main actor, Hitler's an angel. <laughs> main actor played by Bruno Gantz, who played Hitler in the film Downfall, which we reviewed. Is that still our highest rated film? I think it, it is. Because it's amazing. Well, let's find out how this one does. Because <laughs> nah. I give it a 4.8. Like better is Hitler. <laughs> and where that's too low. I give it a 4.6. I'll give it a 3.7. I liked the cinematography. So I'm going to give it a 1.6. Jesus! <laughs> wow, you really hated this. Sure wow. I liked this movie better when it was about a robot named Wally. What? Hmm. I mean, that, no. <laughs> I'm, that I'm, makes sense. I'm into that comparison, actually. It's no, the same fucking story, no. but Wally is better. No, I'm into that comparison. I mean, I, I, I'm into that comparison. Wally, all Wally is there to do is to help people and get this like half experienced version of humanity but then he just wants to get closer no i'm into this this is good lee no i liked it more when it was bill murray trapped in the same day over and over again we can't just keep doing this no. i like that too <laughs> oh hey the wally version is way closer yeah it is lee how many hinges three it's perfectly fine all right that is wings of desire best films ever made <laughs> it's on film track <laughs> check it out if you hate it don't Tell me. Just tell me if you like. Because Oscar will be, be oddly sad. I want to watch it again. <laughs> All right. Let's hear something to, to cheer me up a little bit. Lee, what have we listened to this week? This week, we listened to Teenager of the Year by Frank Black. I could sit on.
Teenager of the Year by Frank Black came out in 1994. It was his second solo album. Um, those who are familiar with music, Frank Black was also is also a member of the Pixies, um, who did the Surfer Rosa album, which we will get to eventually on this list. He so the Pixies is like the mom and dad band, and then. Frank Black did his own stuff, and then Kim Deal, also of the Pixies, did yeah. her own stuff in The Breeders, which we listened to in a song in episode 38. What song was that? Cannonball by The Breeders. Oh, I remember liking that. Yeah, I like the Pixies, so I was really excited about listening to this album. It is exactly like you would expect if you like the Pixies. It sounds like a Pixies album. Yep. I was charmed by this one, because I don't know if I actually heard a full Pixies album before. Pixies did Where's My Mind, right? Yeah. So I've just heard a thousand covers of that and yeah, every right. film ever that is not original. Including a short film I made in high school. <laughs> it was my idea to put it in, but I did do it. But you, but 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 it was your film. Was I in it? Probably. Cool. The odds are good. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean this is a twenty two track album, but yet it only runs an hour, and no song is too long. And they're all good. Right? And they're all good, but there are no hits, right? I, I mean would, like I would agree. There's I mean, no is there there's a single one that on I really album? like? But like, I mean, I'm just wondering. Like, there's there are a couple that I liked more than others too. But was there were any of these like singles? Yes. Which one? Um, headache. Oh yeah, is probably the only one you've ever heard of off of this album. If you haven't listened to this album, and I liked it, it was the only single from that album. It didn't do super big. It got number ten on uh, Billboard's Modern Rock Tracks. Uh. Does it they have a, a strong kind of critical appeal? Why did it uh, resonate still so much? I think just because it's the Pixies tangentially related. So, like, the Pixies are one of those indie darling bands that if you're an indie hipster kid, you like the Pixies by default, whether you actually really like them or not. So I feel like this album just kind of gets lumped into it because it's the exact same genre. It's a, the exact same sound. I don't it's Pixies know. Adjacent. Yeah, I don't know enough about the Pixies to say how this is different and to compare and contrast, but I would wager that it sounds really similar to yeah. all of their other stuff. It's not super experimental, it's not super different, but I did enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, I, I had it on sort of as background music while I worked, and it was nice, it was not challenging. Like, at any yeah. point, I, I didn't stop at any point and go like, oh, interesting. It's not really my genre, and in that way I would say I didn't, like, super duper enjoy it, but it's a perfectly enjoyable... The, the song sounded different enough that I didn't just feel like I was listening to the same song over and over. Like, they were all yeah. interesting individual songs that I liked fine. I'm not sure I could pick one out that was like, ooh, yeah, that was really good, but I mean, they were good. I thought the exact same thing. I I don't know. It's fine. It's good. But there's something about, like, maintaining this tone, and never, but yet never feeling repetitive. Right. I mean, me. like, we've definitely had lots of other other albums we've listened to where we've been like, oh my god, all of these songs are exactly the same. And that's not true of this album. This is worth listening to. Yeah. Like, I, I listened to it numerous times today, and it never got boring, and I never got tired of it, which is really, really rare. Yeah, no, it's true. I At the same time, though, I had trouble thinking of, like, is this anyone's favorite album of all time? Like, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. I bet, but I, but I agree with you. It, it doesn't get boring. There's lots of good music on it. If I had to like describe this album by like a time period of the week, this is like a Thursday afternoon towards huh. the end of the workday album. That makes a lot of sense to me. It's not quite the weekend, so you don't need to pump up music, but you need something with a little bit of energy to get you through the last bit of the work week. Sure. Can you get some hope? Yeah. Thursday is a more I would not day. recommend it. I would not recommend listening to it on a Monday morning when you are very, very tired and possibly hungover. Right. All right. Ask me how I know. How do you know, Lee? I listened to it first thing this morning. Aww. And it, it was a Monday morning, and I was mildly hungover and very, very tired. Oh no! You're, no offense, you're you're one of the worst captains. I think it's Bishop. Yeah, you sh you really shouldn't drive drunk. Like I know there's nothing to hit out of like like the hit out here, but like. Just, just the principle of the thing. She's I mean, what else not, am I gonna do? She's not actually oh, doing. Oh, buddy, that's I sad. I can only virtual farm so that's much. Really sad. She's not doing any of the driving. We know. Okay. The I, principle yeah, of the thing. I've been told numerous times. Why do you think I started drinking? Well, I mean, to be fair, in most states, the definition of the word drive is 
have the ability to be in physical control of a moving vehicle. So, like, you can drive a car without actually, like, moving it forward. Fun fact. Don't sleep in your front seat of your car with your keys in the ignition trunk. Oh. That's drunk driving. Interesting. Because you could, right? I mean, like, because... Yeah. Because, like, you could, right? So you're... Wait, what constitutes a vehicle? A car. Or, well, anything... A lot of things that move. The laws are different for different things, but... So sometimes we're in zero gravity because Pedro presses the wrong switch. Sure. If we push, like, one of the many wheelbarrows that are on the ship... No, that is not a vehicle, no. <laughs> Motor vehicle is generally sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean... But like, if you just, like, push it, then there's it's There's the Scrubs forward. jokes about biking drunk. I don't actually know whether laws exist about biking drunk. The end. All right, hinges. Three and a half. That's perfectly fine. 4.2? 2.9. Oh. No, it was fine. I just will never remember this album ever. Yeah, I, I won't go out of my way to listen to it. Right. There are very few people I would recommend it to. All right, that is Teenager of the Year by Frank Black. All right, now it's time for the food segment. Uh, Casserie. Uh, it's on its way. It'll be good when we get it or something. I actually think it might be kind of gross, but we'll find out. Well, it's coming from Amazon. <laughs> that's what happens when you travel in space and don't stop. And just yep. make them keep catching up to you. All right, that's up for the song segment. Pedro, Woo. what else was listen to this week? We listened to Enter Sandman by Metallica. Different song. Enter Sandman. Give me a dream. No, no, guys, no. You've confused everybody. Enter Sandman is a song, as I said, by Metallica. Came out in 1991 with their album called Metallica. I think it was actually their like fifth album or something, but they self-titled it. Cool. It's the first track. It was the first single. Major success. Platinum in the US and Canada, like everyone loves it, major hit, and it's okay, I guess. What? It's not a bad song, but it's like, a great just song. listening to the album, there are so many other songs that are better or that it's I enjoyed a great more. Song. It's... I have a theory as to why Pedro might not like this song. Why? As much as other songs on this album, because it's probably the same reason that I don't like this song as much as other songs on the album. There is a local radio station yeah. in the Indianapolis market that before they did their most recent format change were alternative rock, specifically the 90s and early 2000s. I love all rock stations. (laughs) Well, they did a statistic before they changed formats to see just exactly how much of which band they were playing. And 12% of the music that they played was Metallica. Was it just this song over and over? It was like this one and two others. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's the problem, right? Because like, God, there's some kind of monster. It's it's just not. Yeah, I heard it a ton on the radio. It's, that didn't help, but it's not emotionally engaging in the way that some of their other songs are. Just musically, it's very kind of flat and dull to me, and it's not. It's interesting what it's about, but but I mean, it's literally not dull and flat. Like it, it rises. It goes down I, and rises. Yeah, but not. Oh, you're so wrong. I don't... You're so wrong, though. I don't think so. But you are, because, like... This was, like, you a few segments ago. But, like... That's well, how like, wrong you are. But, like, it's got the, like... I love this song, because it's got the... <laughs> of, like... <laughs> I'm sorry. Dun, 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 dun. Are you a cowboy? <laughs> Stop getting the girl off the tracks? No, but, like, the there's, a, there's like, a very, like very heavy bass line that I associate with Metallica. Sure. Um, but then it it actually has a chorus that is very satisfying power chord shit. 
It's like Metallica's normal catalog meets Bon Jovi, and I'm so into this song because of that. I like that comparison. I hadn't thought about it that way until you just said it, but I yeah. was like saying, putting it in that perspective. It's got I, power yeah. chords. In the, the, yeah. the chorus like is all it. power chords. I'm trying to remember what this song sounds like. Exit light. Okay, because yeah. I was only thinking of uh, It's My Life. Oh, yeah, no. Bon Jovi, right? <laughs> That's Bon Jovi, right? That's Bon Jovi. Yeah. yeah they have that in the very next song, too, and I liked it better because the chord progression I mean, this was is, more interesting. And this invoking. also has a really good, like, melodic opening hook, though. Yeah, the, that's like fun, but I wish they, like, I, used that more, developed it more in a lyrical way. No, I mean, just... it's a little cheap. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Like, it, it's it's power chords and a lyric, and, 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 and a hook. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying it's some, like, Beautiful piece of genius. Although the the music video is distinctly unnerving in a really good way. Do I not really watch it. Like it. Do not watch it if you have epilepsy. You uh, yeah, can actually, not. Yeah, it's it will actually hurt you. But it it uh it, it did a very good. good job of like reminding me of like being what nightmares are yeah. like. Like yeah. it's it's fucking terrifying. The music video basically follows a child and all the classic nightmares that we have: drowning, falling. Snakes. Trying to run away from Which things. Is not, Snakes. Not my favorite part of the music uh, video. Crawling all over you, just like that helplessness that you feel with a nightmare. And, and this it was well really done. creepy, wrinkly old man. Yes. Who I, is apparently, I assume, supposed to be the Sandman. I like, think so. Fucking terrifying. Either the Trump. Sandman and, like, the no, way kid worse. wasting away as well, because, like, sometimes he appears in the bed where the kid should be, like, I don't know. Yeah, it's super fucked it's, up. It's, it's, it's really, it's cool. It's interesting. Again, don't watch it if you have epilepsy or anything Bert. similar. Um, it's just, I don't know. Maybe I'm bummed out because songs that I like by Metallica aren't even on the extended list of the book. The ones where it's like, mm. special consideration. They just have one and this song. And I feel like they could have I do think Metallica better. is a, is an underappreciated band. <laughs> well, no, I wouldn't say it's underappreciated. I think, let me put it this way. Actually, I would put it differently. Metallica is a probably appropriately appreciated version like part of an underappreciated genre like i think a lot of times when you go for like the hard rock bordering into metal stuff Mm -hmm. there's there's some really good stuff over there Um, yeah mostly you just get metallica but like the book compared this to i mean as far as what it did to metallica's career i guess i'm not sure but they compared it to stairway to heaven and that this is metallica's stairway to heaven Mm-hmm. I don't know. I would probably go more towards Unforgiven or One as like their like recognizable, everyone loves it kind of song. I don't know. If oh wait, this that's has... not what I think. If Stairway have a comparison is, I mean, it almost seems like that's your grand rock opus. Not like, like your, I don't even your, think that your biggest like fan favorite. No, but I don't even think this is their grandest rock opus. Like I no, I this is a hit song. Missing. This is a hit song. Yeah. This is this has the elements that you need. To make people play it on the radio too much. Yeah. Um, and I love it. It's great. <laughs> I just... I think sure. So. Awesome. Uh, f- four. I'll give four as well. Four point four. Three. All right, that is Enter Sandman by Metallica. Also, I just want to note that the other song that Marty McFly performs in Back to the Future is Earth Angel. Earth Angel. Which is a great song. So he made the movie. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Marty McFly is responsible for most art. Yes. Yeah. Including what children's book? Eclipse of the Crescent Moon by Giza Gardonier. So did Marty McFly write that? Uh, no, Giza Gardonier is credited as writing it, but after reading it, um, I will tell you if Marty McFly wrote it, because we didn't have it this week. Nope. So, we'll, we'll get there it soon. you go. And we'll see Marty McFly's influence on it. Aren't all crescent moons kind of eclipsed? Like, I mean, it's not like there's something moving in front of it, right? Yeah. It's just a matter of what it's angled. Right. So, no. Cool. If we were on the sun, then yes. Right? Because huh? the Earth would be eclipsing True. the moon. Anyhow, now it's time for the TV show segment. And this week we're viewing for Bright Elson, The Killing. It's The Killing. The 
Killing is a three-season Danish crime show that was popularly remade here in America on AMC and Netflix. It is about Detective Inspector Sarah Lund, and I believe I've only seen I was only able to watch a handful of episodes from season one, so I don't know how much they they change from season to season, but I assume every season is a case. And the first season is all about the murder of this young girl and how it ties into this political campaign that is ongoing. And it's good. I mean, it's a really beautiful looking show. It's a really well done aesthetic looking show. The acting is quite good. Her new partner is, of course, from Borgia, because if there are 15 British actors, I think there are five, five Danish, Danish actors. actors yeah. so. But it's it's good. And so I, I didn't finish season one uh, before doing this review. I am going to finish it because I am intrigued. But it, it's not fair to this show now, but it is, I think, on my mind, too similar to Broadchurch. Uh, but Broadchurch definitely came out after. And, I mean, with, with the... It even, like, looks the same. You, you have a female, you know, inspector, new, tall, lanky, European guy as the new partner, sad death. And it's, it really focuses, much like both shows, about the, the mourning of everybody. It really kind of focuses on the aftermath of the family and the, just the honest discomfort that death can bring. And that is something that is nice as opposed to something like Arne Dahl, which is so procedural. And yeah, it, it is it is good, but I don't think it's something that is truly revolutionary. But I can see why it had such a big following, because this is one of those shows that would also play in lots of other countries in Europe, because they're much more willing to watch foreign TV shows than us. We rather uh, spend millions to remake it than to just air it the exact same way. I want to fucking read a TV show. Lee, your acting is getting better. I swear to God. I know, I'm getting so good. You're so good at acting. But, yeah, it, it's good. I only saw the first two episodes of the remake that was on AMC, and I did not like that. This one, I think, is significantly better. I mean, both had nice acting, but the other one was so on the nose with its human drama elements. This, I think, is very organic, especially with, I think, the way the campaign is trying to pivot in a way, while also being very aware that no one wants to politically pivot away from this kind of like dead girl, you know what I mean? Like it's not mm-hmm. like it, no one wants to say the wrong thing and offend a grieving person, especially if you're a right. political figure. Uh, so close to home. So yeah, that's that's the killing. I think I'll kind of come back and, and check in once I've seen more episodes because it only had forty episodes total. 20, 10, and 10. So I think I'd like to say more, especially if it solves the mystery in a satisfying way. I think that could be something rather special. But for now, I've just seen a a pinch of it. So I will check back in more later. But for right now, I'll just give it a, a four. So that's The Killing, and this is episode 98. Woo-hoo. Yeah. That was good. We did good. Woo-wee. I like good. Now, let's, now again, like I said, let's get a little... Too much cabin fever in here. We've got cabin fever. Fuck you, Austin. We've lost our sense My of ship cabin. is perfect. We've got <laughs> cabin fever. We're all going mad. I mean, I'd feel better if my walls weren't literally closing in on me. I'd feel better if you, yeah, you guys turn liked this off, of Pedro. <laughs> all right, I can turn it off. Marin, disengage. Shrinking. Disengaged. There you go. Feels pretty much the same. Well, yeah, because it stops shrinking. It's not getting bigger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, why can't it get bigger? Marion, return to normal size. Returning to normal size. Except Austin's bunk. Austin's <laughs> bunk stays the same. Jesus Christ. It's in her hands now, I'm sorry. You give her hands now? Sure. Too big now. <laughs> Adam's Fine. bunk. Way too big. Adam's bunk shrunk Everything down. Everything I do is wrong. I shrunk do I down do to this? medium size. Yeah, this is this this is good. I'm happy with what you gave me. Thank you, Pedro. I'm happy with the third option. I'll be happy if we had next week's number. Fuck you, Austin. Okay. You know what? This is not... This is this is a rough episode, I feel. For me. You all seem fine. Fine, you jerk. Three. 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 We only have a thousand and one numbers. Three. Three. 
Three. She's repeating three. 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 I think we already did three. three. Broken. Three. It's what three. about three hundred and thirty three? Is your opinion thirty three? Three. 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 Marion. Three. three. Sleep now, please. Three. <laughs> you gave her story? <laughs> yeah. Why? Because she deserves <laughs> to have what we have. Did you not watch the same film we did? I did. All right, screw it. We're doing 333. What, what are those? Uh, see, the food is something called pasky sear. I mean, I guess that's some sort of fish I can't get, but we'll find out. Sure. The movie is North by Northwest. There you go, guys. There's a plot. <laughs> Woo! There's a movie where things happen and it's exciting and fun. Yes, it is. Oh, uh, I boy. bet it's going to do great. Shut up. <laughs> Oh, Deja Vu, I guess. Shaft? We've done Shaft. We did the album. Well, now we're doing the theme again. Are you oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we get to go around again. It's garbage. What? It's garbage. It's guys liked cheating. It shouldn't be on the album's list. Oh, yeah, that, that part. Well, what is yeah. the album? The album for next week is Young Americans by David Bowie. Damn, that's Ooh. really good. What's Tom's book? Oh, the places you'll go by <gasps> Dr. Seuss. Aw, you mean the thing that, that every is. single person ever got for their graduation present? Not I mean, didn't. I didn't. This will be my first time reading this book. Really? Mm-hmm. Literally, was... when you're in a spaceship flying across the stars, <laughs> mm-hmm. right. you're going to see as bad places you go. And let's see what perfect TV show will, come, will just encompass all this greatness. Farmer Wants a Wife. This is a dating reality show. Well, you know there's an app now called Farmers Only. Really? Delightful. Yeah, it's a, or not an app. It's was that a, on, a dating website. Was that on John Oliver? Probably. Okay. We'll see how many apps they can find on this show. <laughs> but you can find all that next week, next Thursday, episode 99. It's kind of crazy. Um, until then, please go to theartmore.com. Let us know what you think of all these things, like Wings of Desire and Metallica. While you're there, you can check out the other podcasts, including Let's Take Five. Tomorrow, we're going to have our third week of Gene Kelly. And we're going to have the wonderful film, It's Always Fair Weather, which was a major influence on The World's End. But great. Cool. Now you know. Uh, Adam Serb should be coming out soon with it's on The Purge, <laughs> Sorry, right? guys. Yeah, I, it's editing. I am bad at it at the end. So The Purge. Oh, yeah. No, that too. <laughs> you can also follow us on Twitter at The Immortals Pod, where Lee does lots of silly things, like say some bullshit about Ray Donovan getting renewed. Hmm. And uh, you can email us at the art, the immortals at the com. You can find all of Adam's spiffy music on songs by a Lord. Special thanks to Rook for editing this episode and taking out all the bullshit. Uh, so hope you enjoyed this 30 second episode. Yep. Anything else you guys want to plug? Nope. Mm-mm. No. Is there? No. <laughs> what, what notes were you looking at of things you were going to plug? Well, if there were notes, there would be something to look at. This is not. No. I'm Austin. I'm Adam. I'm Sarah. I'm Lee. I'm Pedro. We'll catch you all next week, everyone. Thank you, Martin McFly. Bye. Bye. See you.